you know, this is what I love about doing this podcast. You come across one article and it just puts a huge smile on your face. Because it gives you more opportunities to just continue hating on, for many people, the most hated video game company in the world. And there's not really much else I can say beyond that. But I'm going to get into that very, very shortly. Because, my word, do we have a massive gaming screw-up of the week. And I've got not one, but two articles regarding this issue. So here we go, this is episode 2 of season 2 of the Trophy Achievement Podcast. So coming up today we've got news on EA and their cancelled Star Wars game project. We also have news on the private beta on The Division 2, plus 8 changes coming to Steam in 2019. News on Anthem. Ubisoft regarding Assassin's Creed Odyssey, news on Forza Horizon 4, and why Tech Radar thinks Metro Exodus is the antidote to Fallout 76, the story length of Resident Evil 2 Remake has been confirmed, and we've also got news on Hideo Kojima with Death Stranding. And the first two hours of the game have been completed, but the game is still incomplete as of yet. We've got news on Pokemon Go's Hoenn event, which is now currently underway. What games are coming to Xbox Game Pass? And in the points and trophy section, today it came out on PlayStation 3. A few years ago, but it is on PS4 as of today, as I'm recording this. The trophy list for Yakuza 4. Don't worry, Kingdom Hearts fans. Next week, I'll be doing the trophy list for Kingdom Hearts 3. I will be doing the Kingdom Hearts 3 trophy list just for you guys. All this coming up on today's edition of the Trophy Achievement Podcast. If you're looking for a place to go and find some trophies, this is the place to be in the charge of your fees. If you're on Xbox and need some game to score, come over here, I'll help you get some more. My name is Ken Z. Troll, the host of the show, gaming news and reviews and all you need to know. Because the weekend is finally here at last, sit back, relax, enjoy the Trophy Achievement Podcast. Hello my fellow Latter-day Saints, Kenzie Retro here and welcome to episode 2 of season 2 of the Trophy Achievement Podcast. Your one-stop shop as always for the points and trophies for your favourite games and of course the latest gaming news and rumours. Before we get into the news I'd like to send a big shout out as always to Boomerang Mentors. Packages start from as little as $3.99 a month. Sign up today, you get a 21 day free trial and you get 3 free game rentals before your subscription service begins. There are no late fees, you can keep the game as long as you like, so you could go for the Platinum Trophy or get the 100%. Or you can keep the game forever at a discounted price from the online store itself. Once you start renting, you're going to start saving. This is for UK viewers only. That's boomerangrentals.co.uk, the best place to rent your games. But before we get into our main portion of news, we have got news regarding Electronic Arts. What did they screw up this week? Let's all laugh at an industry that never learns anything, tee hee hee. 
Well, as it turns out, they have actually cancelled the Star Wars open world game that was being worked on by Visceral Games, who are now sadly shut down. The latest in the casualty list of EA's um, death tally. So here we go. This is what we have. This is, this is the first of two articles regarding this story. The open world Star Wars game in development at EA Vancouver has been cancelled. That's according to a new report from Kotaku that credits the information to three sources who reportedly have inside knowledge of the matter. Updates on this is additional sources have told Kotaku that the open world Star Wars project has indeed been cancelled in favour of a smaller scale project that can be released sooner. Subsequently, EA issued a statement in which it doesn't deny cancelling the game. So this is what the original article said. This is on GameSpot.com, by the way. The original story says, According to the report, EA Vancouver's Star Wars title was a reboot of the Star Wars project that Visceral Games was working on, to, on until EA closed that studio in 2017. EA Vancouver continued to use some of the assets from Visceral's game, but transitioned the title to become an open-world experience, Kotaka reported. Executive Patrick Soderlund, who has since left EA, previously confirmed that Visceral Star Wars game was a story-based linear adventure game. However, responding to market trends and player feedback, EA decided to pivot the design to make it a title that players could come back to and enjoy for a long time to come, which suggests it was becoming more multiplayer focused, which I'm not a big fan of. Story game... Story-based games are what I live for. I love story-based games. I would happily play them over multiplayer games any day because I'm not the best at multiplayer. At the same time, Soderlund announced that EA Vancouver would lead development on this title and that it was also delayed. Now it is cancelled outright, apparently. The Star Wars game Visceral had in development was being headed up by Uncharted veteran Amy Henning. Hennig. She said it may be spiritually similar to Uncharted, but to, to Uncharted, but that it will also be its own thing. Hennig has since left EA altogether. Good on you, Amy. You don't want to be working for Gaming Satan at this point. EA did not respond to GameSpot's request for comments at press time, but keep checking back for us with us for the latest. Basically, we're just saying we're not going to comment on anything because we don't like giving ourselves a bad name. Um, Newsflash, you've been doing that for years now, EA. While EA Vancouver Star Wars game may be cancelled, the publisher continues its work on a third-person Star Wars action-adventure, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order with Titanfall Studio Respawn Entertainment, which we still know absolutely nothing about! Now, I watched a video from Yong Ye, or whatever his name is. Big shout out to you, buddy. He did a video, or somebody did a video, where in the span, in a four year period, while the Star Wars license was, was, was with LucasArts, they made 16 games over the course of a four year period. EA have only made two, and, not, and neither of them have been that great. The backlash from Star Wars Battlefront 2 was so severe that government actually got involved. It's going to get to a point where loot boxes are no longer going to be viable in the video game industry because they will be illegal. They've already been made illegal in Belgium. Let's start the domino effect. Let's make the loot boxes illegal so EA can be laughed at for how poorly managed their business practices are. Kotaku also reported that EA Vancouver's Star Wars game was very early in development and that no jobs were lost as a result of the reported cancellation. The game was said to put you in the shoes of a scoundrel or bounty hunter who hopped around different open world planets. As for why the game was supposed to be cancelled, sources said EA management wanted to launch something on a more immediate on the more immediate horizon. As a result, EA is now reportedly working on a smaller scale Star Wars game to launch in late 2020. 
in 2013, EA signed a multi-year, multi-title deal with Disney for Star Wars games. That licensing contract was set to run for 10 years, so it may expire in 2023 unless the terms were adjusted without being discussed publicly. EA previously found itself embroiled in Star Wars controversy when Star Wars Battlefront 2's microtransaction system made headlines and led to wider discussions from governments around the world about loot boxes in video games. Literally what I just talked about. Disney, for the love of all the sane people in the world, please get the E get the Star Wars license as far away from EA as possible. Do not work with EA ever again. Please. For the love of all that's holy, save us our sanity and get the Star Wars license away from EA, please. We're six years into this deal and it's not going well. Please, EA. And as it just so happens, EA finally responded. And this is following a report that Electronic Arts had cancelled the open world Star Wars game in development at EA Vancouver. The publisher has finally responded with a statement. Unfortunately, it doesn't offer any real insight, though tellingly it does nothing to dispel what Kotaku's story laid out. Basically, they're not willing to admit the game's been cancelled. That's basically what it is. They are not admitting the game has been cancelled. There's been speculation overnight about one of our Star Wars projects as a natural part of the creative process. The great work by our team in Vancouver continues and will evolve into future Star Wars content and games. The company said in a statement shared with GameSpot, we're fully committed to making more Star Wars games. Then stop making games that are actually good! We're very excited about Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Yeah, so you can get more money out of us from Respawn. And we'll share more about our new projects when the time is right. More like when we decide to. That is far from a denial that it's cancelled the project, which was said to be an open world reboot of what had previously been in development. At the now defunct Visceral Games, when the former Dead Space developer was shuttered, Vancouver assumed control of the project, which morphed into something quite different, but would use assets from Visceral. Kotaku's report states Vancouver is now work at work on a smaller scale Star Wars game that can be released sooner, than would have been possible with the open world game. I would have rather waited for the open world game. I would have rather waited for the open world game. You know why? Because waiting for that open world game means there's the chance of actually having a good Star Wars game under EA's banner. But I refuse to play EA's games if Anthem doesn't do well. I will refuse to play EA games ever again. Do not mess up Anthem EA or you will never hear the end of it. If Bioware gets closed down, that's it. EA are going to get crucified, hung, drawn and quartered by every single fan of Bioware's games. I don't think they won't hesitate. Don't think they'll hesitate. Because I know for a certainty I won't hesitate to tear EA apart. EA have done nothing that has been of any positivity since they took the Star Wars license. The first Battlefront game, no single player campaign. Star Wars Battlefront 2, the loot box controversy that has reached across the entire world to the point where Belgium have banned loot boxes in any games that are released. This is just the start, EA. You better start cleaning up your act. You better start cleaning up your act, EA. Or it's game over.
It's been rough going for Star Wars games at EA. That's an understatement, both in terms of this specific project and more broadly. Battlefront 2 had an extremely rough launch after players objected to the use of what was perceived as pay-to-win mechanics, which were ultimately pulled at the 11th hour just before release. And then you decided to reinstate the microtransactions anyway! As noted in EA's statement, the company does have Jedi Fallen Order in development at Respawn, which, again, we still know absolutely nothing about! Respawn, the studio known... The game is in development at Respawn, the studio known for the Titanfall series. Little is known about the game, which stars a young Jedi Padawan after Order 66 is carried out in Revenge of the Sith. Respawn has multiple game sets for, the, for release before the end of 2019, which could include both Jedi Fallen Order and Titanfall 3. It, it's also working on an, announced, an unannounced VR game. What the future holds for EA's Star Wars games is unclear, but the company does have a licensing agreement that gives it exclusive rights to make Star Wars games on console. That deal runs out on that deal runs until 2023. Disney, get the Star Wars license away from EA as soon as possible. Please. Right, so anyway, uh, Ubisoft have had a screw up this week as well. Have they screwed up the mo meaning of the word difficulty again? Um, actually, no they haven't. They have apologised for forcing your Assassin's Creed Odyssey character into a straight relationship. Um... LGBT relationships would have seen you burnt at the stake back in the days of ancient Greece. You do not need to have every single game pander to the LGBT community. Now, I have nothing against the LGBT community, I'm part of the community myself, but this is ridiculous. You don't need to have every game pander to the... You do not need every single game to pander to the LGBT community. And it's regarding the DLC. Brilliant. Here we go. This post contains more about Assassin's Creed Odyssey DLC. Don't care, not interested. If you don't, if you don't want to, if you don't want any uh, spoilers regarding the Assassin's Creed Odyssey DLC, feel free to skip ahead in the video. This is another article on GameSpot. Ubisoft recently generated controversy when it revealed it, that the newest Assassin's Creed Odyssey expansion, Shadow Heritage, would force players into a straight relationship for a period of time. Now, creative director Jonathan Dumont has apologised, and he also explained why it happened. At the end of the content, Cassandra or Alexios, depending on who you're playing as, has a child in a heterosexual relationship. Dumont said in a forum, forum post that it was important for the game to establish how your character's bloodline has a lasting impact on the assassins. However, Dumont acknowledged that Ubisoft missed the mark. We want to indicate... We want to extend an apology to players disappointed by a relationship your character partakes in, he explained. Alexios or Cassandra realising their own mortality and the sacrifice Leonidas and Mirine made before them to keep their legacy alive. Felt the desire to, and duty to preserve their important lineage. Our goal was to let players choose between utilitarian view, between a utilitarian view of ensuring your bloodline lived on 
or, for, or forming a romantic relationship. We attempted to distinguish between the two, but could have done this more carefully as we are walking a narrow line between roleplay choices and story. And the clarity choice and the clarity and motivation for this decision was poorly executed. Do these guys even do their research? Players do not need to continue this relationship in the next chapter of the DLC, Dumont added. He also said that this has been a learning experience for Ubisoft. What have you learned from this? That you can't do DLC properly? If you're gonna do something like this, then... If you knew this was... If you knew this was gonna be a tough choice to make, then don't put it in the game to begin with! Either that or ask your fans. Ask your fans what they want. The players come first! Because at this point, the players know a hell of a lot more about how to make games than the big developers and publishers ever will. The indie game market has never been stronger. What are the games with gold for January? Celeste. One of the top games of 2018. Now, I've started playing some of it. And I'm enjoying it. I'm technically classing Ori and the Blind Forest as an indie game. Yes, it was published under Microsoft, but it's done by an independent studio, Moon Studios, who got backing from Microsoft. If you knew this was going to be a disaster, don't put it in the game! He promised that Ubisoft will do better to make sure that player choice, which Ubisoft had hyped as one of the core tenants, tenants of the game, stays intact going forward. Guarantee they screw that up in the next game. Guarantee you. The move to force players into a heterosexual relationship was especially grating for some because, as mentioned, it ran counter to what Ubisoft had promised up until this point. That you could make your own choices with regards to romantic partners. At E3 2018, Odyssey's narrative director, Melissa Kuberi, uh, Kubri, stressed how the game would allow players to choose their romantic partners. If you want to be a woman and romance a woman, you can do that. If you want to be a man and romance a woman, you can do that. If you want to be a man and romance a man and a woman, you can do that. She told Steve Iver at the same... She told Steve Iver at the time. The title of the achievement or trophy for Shadow Heritage that unlocks after the child's birth is Growing Up, and the name is stirring controversy as well. The name of the achievement will be changed in the forthcoming patch, according to Kotaku. If you knew the if you knew the trophy name was going to cause controversy, then don't use the name to begin with! I know that may I know that makes me sound like I'm part of Generation Snowflake, but come on. Shadow of the Heritage is part of the Legacy of the First Blade paid DLC for Odyssey. In addition to new story content, it added a new hunter ability. Rapid fire, which allows players to fire arrows rapidly without reloading. You can watch the opening minutes of Shadow Heritage in the video embedded in the article. 
Not interested. Right, we're going to have one more. F we're going to have one more article from GameSpot before we move on to the next section. Right, so here we go. After Fortnite's lawsuits, Forza Horizon 4 removes Carlton and Floss Dance emotes. It looks like Microsoft wants to avoid a legal situation of its own. Well, kudos Microsoft. Here we go. A new update for Microsoft's racing game Forza Horizon 4 removes the Carlton and Floss Dance emotes, which are similar to the ones le that led to lawsuits against Epic over their use in Fortnite. Microsoft quietly removed the dance emotes in the Xbox One and PC games latest update. The patch notes posted in on the Forza website only states that the Carlton and Floss avatar emotes are no longer available. Microsoft provided no explanation for why the dance emotes were removed, but it seems likely that the company saw what happened to Fortnite and wanted to avoid legal action taken, being taken against its game. This is only guesswork. A Microsoft representative offered the following statement to GameSpot on the removal of emotes. The Forza Horizon 4 features a large portfolio of content and is continuously updated. Alfonso Ribeiro, the actor of, from The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, sued Epic Games for using the Carlton in Fortnite, while the Backpack, while Backpack Kid also sued Fortnite for using Floss in the game. These, those cases, which seek to see the game stop using the emotes and pay damages, are ongoing. Epic... Epic has also been sued by rapper Terence Ferguson, who claims Epic stole his Millie Rock dance for Fortnite's Swipe It emote. Actor Donald Faison's trademark dance for, from the show Scrubs also appears to be replicated in Fortnite as an emote, and Faison, Faison said Epic jacked his dance for the game. GameSpot's search of the database containing world nationwide court records for, United, for the United States yields no apparent results for any lawsuits against Microsoft over dance emails in Forza Horizon 4. Because Fortnite is cancer and it is poison to the kids to the point where they have been sent to rehab because they are addicted to the game. There appears to be some amount of uncertainty regarding whether or not a dance move can even be trademarked. However, it remains to be seen what specific legal tactics that Ribeiro, Backpack Kit, and others will use in their cases against Epic against Fortnite. Keep checking back with GameSpot for more on the story. I mean, wow. I mean, well done, Microsoft. Well done, Microsoft, on their... Damage control that actually works. They saw what was happening and thought, oh, we better we better avoid this. Let's just take these out just to be safe. Fair play to them. Yes, I've started drinking protein shakes, folks. Now, my thoughts on this. Well done, Microsoft, but like I say. There's no action against There's no There's no doubt that Fortnite is much more popular than Forza Horizon 4. But that popularity does come with a cost, however. That popularity has caused nothing but backlash from gamers, health organizations, among other things. Which is why I rarely play, which is why I hardly actually played the game. Now, don't get me wrong, I've played a few games of Fortnite. But I just don't see what all the fuss is about. Because of how successful Fortnite has been, we're at a point where every single game being released
every single game has a battle royale mode. That's the point we're at. Every single game has a battle royale mode. It is not necessary in every single game. Call of Duty didn't need it. Battlefield didn't need it. Red Dead Redemption 2 now has a battle royale mode. Not everything needs battle royale. Next thing you know, heaven forbid, we're going to have sports games that have a battle royale mode. Unbelievable. Now, Division 2, next. These next few articles are going to be from PC Gamer. Christopher Livingston wrote to this article, Division 2 Private Beta will begin in February. Pre-ordering guarantees slots, but you can also register for a chance at the beta as space allows. Right, it's a short article, but here goes. A private beta for Tom Clancy's The Division 2 will begin on February 7th, Ubisoft has announced over a month ahead of the official launch plan for March 15th. The beta will be a short one, running only until February 10th, so clear your plans for that weekend if you want to take an early tour through the pandemic-ravaged ruins of Washington, D.C. It's always a big city. It's always LA, New York, or Washington. Why not go for other cities? Anyway, there are two ways to take part in this beta, pre-ordering the game, and remember it's not on Steam this time, as I reported last week, it's going to be on the Epic Games launcher. You can also register at the official site for a chance to make make it into the beta as space allows. Not a guarantee in other words. Right. Anyway, here we go. Valve announces eight changes coming to Steam in 2019. Machine learning discoverability, a new library, updates to Steam TV, and more are on the way. And this was written by James Davenport for PC Gamer. In a big blog post, in a big blog post reflecting on the life of Steam in 2018, Valve detailed some of the new features planned for the go-to PC gaming client in 2019. Below all the below all the numbers and pie charts explaining growth and infrastructure changes and lessons learned. 
Valve finally puts a release window on a long-awaited library update built on the same technology introduced with the recent Steam Chat update. Steam, with Steam just reaching 30,000 games, not including DLC or software, it's about time. Among the other updates, machine learning, dri machine learning driven changes to store discoverability are on the way. And thank goodness too, I swear, I look at one sexy anime game and suddenly Steam thinks I'm the sexy anime game guy. The machines will learn the truth. Steam's officially coming to China in partnership with Perfect World, a Chinese studio best known for its MMOs. A new events system will hopefully prove more insightful than alarming. That bing will always make me pee a little bit. And Steam TV will support all games in the near future, ideally making streaming on Steam a somewhat viable home for our beloved content creators. But wait! But wait! There's more! The matchmaking tech behind CSGO will become available to all games. Valve's been banning cheaters for over a decade now, so hopefully the tech crew is reliable to small online games without the development muscle to make their own or the money to license it elsewhere. A new mobile Steam chat app will make, make telling rogue TF2 item traders no much easier. And finally, the special PC cafe build of Steam is getting upgraded. I didn't even know there was a special PC cafe version of Steam to begin with. So it's hard to guess what an upgrade entails. Maybe there's an espresso menu built in this time. I'll take one half latte, three shots please. Right, so here we go. This is, these are the full changes coming. These are the changes coming to the, these are the changes that are coming to Steam in 2019. Here we go. Store discoverability. We're working on a new recommendation engine powered by machine learning that can match players to games based on their individual tastes. Algorithms are only a part of our discoverability solution. However, so however, so we're building more broadcasting and curating features and are constantly assessing the overall design of the store. Steam China. We've partnered with Perfect World to begin Steam on to bring Steam onshore into China. We'll reveal more details about this in the coming months. Steam library update. So so long awaited change. Some long-awaited changes to the Steam client will ship, including a reworked Steam library built on top of the technology we shipped in with Steam Chat. Event systems. We're upgrading the event system in the Steam community, enabling you to highlight interesting activities in your games like tournaments, streams, or weekly challenges. Steam TV. We're working on expanding Steam TV beyond just broadcasting specific tournaments and special events in order to supply, in order to support all games. Steam Chat. We're going to ship a new Steam Chat mobile app so you can share your favorite gifts with your friends while on the go. Steam Trust. The technology behind, behind trusted matchmaking in CSGO is getting an upgrade and will become a full Steam feature that will be available to all games. This means you'll have more information that you can use to help determine how likely a player is a cheater or not. And Steam PC Cafe program. We are going to officially ship a new cafe program so that players can have a good experience using Steam in the hundreds of thousands of PC cafes worldwide. Last. So we got last article on PC Gamer before we move on to the next STEM article. Anthem will have matchmaking for every activity in the game. This is by Fraser Brown on PC Gamer. No mates? No problem. Anthem lead producer Ben Irving has confirmed that Bioware's impending shooter will feature matchmaking for every single activity, unlike Destiny or MMOs like World of Warcraft, which restricts the most challenging dungeons and raids to pre-made groups. There is matchmaking for every activity in the game. This is according to Ben Irving on Twitter. And he responded to a tweet by Loki Prime saying, Will there be public matchmaking or will we have to play with people that we invite to our party? Probably won't get answers, but I'd love to know. And 
Ben Irving confirmed there is matchmaking for every activity in the game. Irving clarified that matchmaking will be opt-out, so you won't need to tackle everything as a group. But for harder stuff, you'll probably want to bring some friends along. This is all good news for me, as an as the archaic ritual, archaic ritual of standing around looking for a group puts me right off again now. If my friends aren't around, just toss me in any old ragtag band and let me get on with it. Irving has been answering lots of questions on Twitter as Anthem's launch approaches, revealing some UI customization, the sort of loot you'll get and that javelins, all have the same top speed but different handling. Anthem is due out on February 22nd. Cheers, Polygon! That makes it sound like they took the article from uh, Polygon. Anyway. Next up, Tech Radar, uh, Vic Hood um, wrote an article uh, on Tech Radar saying why Metro Exodus is the antidote to Fallout 76. Now, whether there's something in the water or the political climate has, whether there's some, whether there's something in the water or the political climate has us all a bit pessimistic, we can, we can't just. We just can't get enough of the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it, and we're not doing fine. Less said about that, the better. Zombies, atomic bomb, or maybe a deadly virus? Modern media is awash with various iterations of how society will crumble, and video games are the biggest offender. Hmm, yeah, because we haven't seen enough post-apocalyptic uh, games already. The twilight of the current console generation has seen a host of post-apocalyptic post titles emerge. Oh, the irony. 2018 saw the release of Icy Survival Sim Frostpunk and Zombie Shooter State of Decay K2 and Bethesda's Rage 2 and Obsidian's The Outer Worlds are set to be come out in 2019. But you can't have an apocalypse without a disaster and we've certainly had those too with one game in particular springing to mind. Ooh, goody! Fallout 76 promised to be the kind of open-world wasteland we've come to expect from the series, but when Todd Howard revealed the game would be online, our hearts sank, and it turns out, for good reason. Fallout 76 was a shell of what it was capable of, lacking in heart and diluting a formula that had previously worked so well for Bethesda. The general consensus among fans was, if it's not broken, then don't fix it. In the wake of the Fallout, pun intended, we're left with a radioactive shaped hole in our heart, which we should probably see a doctor about, but we may have found just the right game to fill it. It's not long until we see the release of post-apocalyptic survival horror Metro Exodus, with just under a month to wait before we can get down and dirty with the Russian dystopia. We saw the title earlier at Gamescom 2018, and got a preview of the game's autumn level, called Tega. But now that the game is nearly complete, we couldn't pass up a chance to take a look once again before release and get some time with the game's Volga, Spring, and Caspian, Summer levels. To be honest, we wanted to make sure we weren't in for another disappointment, but instead we found a potential replacement for those Fallout Blues. Spring in your step. Goodness me, this is an article and a half. Right. Spring in your step. Here we go. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but with a whimper. T.S. Eliot famously wrote in his poem, The Hollow Men, and it's a quote which swirls around our head as we navigate the deteriorating wasteland of Metro Exodus. Grey industrial buildings are sunken into a mix of filthy snow, radioactive clouds, rust, and blood. That's pleasant. This is the way the world ends, and it's in a way we've rarely seen. 
it isn't stylishly sexy like Mad Max, or painted with fluorescent rebels in, like in the Raid series. No, though, no, those are Western depictions of the apocalypse. And Metro's author, Dmitry Glukovsky, does not abide by this mold. Glukovsky has made no secret that the Metro series is a commentary on the current social and political climate. Metro Exodus, along with the book Metro 2035, that essentially acts as its foreword, touches on the refugee crisis in both Russia and Europe, as well as the impact the Cold War has had on the Russian mindset. What we lacked was an enemy, Glukovsky explains, referring to aftermath of referring to the aftermath of the Cold War. Still geared for war, the author believes the Russian people directed their post-Cold War disdain elsewhere focusing on the refugees fleeing to the country. They inspired, Met they inspired Metro's mutants. They're totally like us, but they, are the, but they are the inverse of us. We can't communicate with them, so we hate them, he explains. It's no surprise that Glukovsky paints a picture of di a dystopia unlike what we're used to in the West. His vision is influenced by the Soviet punk style of post-Cold War Russia and the industrialization that followed in that turbulent era. It's a period that stayed fresh in the countryman's mind, particularly under the reign of Putin. Oh, goodness me. We Russians were so glad to get back to the bunker, the bunker of the Cold War, in which we were sitting expecting to be bombed every day. Glukovsky tells us, reiterating how much our underlying desire to find enemies because we need them influ because we need them influence Metro's world. People do not see the purpose in their lives without struggle, Krukowski continues. No one wants a real war, but they want to feel like but they want to feel like it when they sit on the couch at home, that they're struggling against something. Glukovsky's apocalypse is dark, unforgiving, and full of radioactive creatures from a fever dream. You play as Artyom Artyom and is uh, wait who has recently fled the confines of the Moscow Metro and is now leading a band of Spartan Rangers on a train journey east to safety. The first play level we play is Volga, set in springtime. You would be forgiven for mistaking it for winter as the Aurora plows through the snow and frozen lakes of 2036 Russia. Goodness me, imagine if this actually happened. A blockade stops the locomotive in its tracks, forcing Artyom and his partner Anna to venture out, giving us a closer look at the frigid landscape. Metro Exodus is essentially linear, through though the game gives you room to wander. In fact, you'll probably have to given its light touch design, rather than hand holding you through where to go. Metro Exodus requires you to navigate the old school way, using a compass and a map. Though frustrating at times, it actually makes for an extra sense of adventure. Hmm. While you can stray away from the marker, it's better to stick to your goal and venture further afield only when ammo or resources are low and scavenging is a necessity. Unfortunately, this is quite common. Every bullet counts. This isn't a game where you can be trigger happy. Each bullet may as well have a name engraved on it, like Steve, the giant woodlouse creature that attacked me in the lake. <laughs> Gathering those resources al also allows for upgrades to weapons such as modifying a gun's mach magazine, stock, barrel, and even adding a gadget. This can be done on the move, but you're not safe doing so. It can easily be and can easily be killed while tending to wounds or modifying weapons. You've been warned. Firewalk with me. Perhaps the most dynamic level we've played was the Caspian, summer chapter. As we walked through the sandy, desolate ruins of the desert, there was a sense of deja vu. The environment was reminiscent of the news footage from war-torn countries as you watch soldier tr soldiers troop through battle-ravaged villages and desolation. the desolation and survival culture was evident. It's at this point that you put your that your gas mask proves more than just a fashion accessory. 
Radioactive dust blowing around isn't good for the lungs, so maintaining your gas, gas mask is paramount to surviving. The Caspian catapults us into the story of Metro Exodus. As the tension ramps up, so do the enemies as we, as we scavenge the ruins of mural clad walls. We were hard pressed to avoid running into a mutant at every turn. Snarling, ugly and dusty, they looked as though they climbed straight out of hell. Unfortunately for us, word travels fast in the underworld, and it wasn't long before we were fleeing from a horde of crawling creatures, all while careful to avoid flaming tumbleweeds that rolled by. Should have been more careful with the bullets. Should have been more careful with the bullets. We hiss to no one in particular as we slam mutants with the butt of a rifle. And that's really the point of Metro. It's a thinking person's fallout. There's a political story encased in the dark and industrial world, but you'll miss it if you don't look hard enough. For those who prefer to simply take their games at face value, it also offers that with more mutants than you can shake a stick at, and a collection of madcap characters. Metro Exodus is due for release for due to release for PC, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4 on February 15th, 2019. Interesting. Very interesting. Now, next up, we've got WCCFTech.com and it's Francesco De Mayo, De Mayo, or however you pronounce his second name. Uh, Resident Evil 2 remake st total story length confirmed by the director and producer. The Resident Evil 2 remake, uh, Resident Evil 2 remake is almost upon us and new details on it have emerged during a recent launch event held in Dubai. During the event, director Kazunori Kado, Kadoi and producer Yoshiaki Hirabayashi have been asked about the total length of the story, which will be around 10 hours long for each character. As there are plenty of shared sequences between the two characters, the second playthrough is going to be shorter, but this is a very good length for a survival horror game, and in line with the total length of the original game. Additionally, the two members of the team have been asked about the possible Resident Evil 3 Nemesis remake. They currently don't have anything to share on the matter, but it's likely that it will eventually be developed. Considering how Resident Evil 2 Remake is setting out to be a smashing success. If you cannot wait to get your hands on Resident Evil 2 Remake, you can download the one-shot demo right now on PC, PS4 and Xbox One. The demo can only be played once with a 30 minute time limit. Although several workarounds have been found in previous days. Resident Evil 2 Remake launches January 25th on PC, PlayStation 4 and Xbox One in all regions. Now initially the release date for the Resident Evil 2 remake was um it was initially going to be um what was it, it was initially going to be January 29th my word, what a day gamers have on January 25th, just a week tomorrow. Isn't that it? January 25th, Kingdom Hearts 3 and the Resident Evil 2 remake. I'm sold. As we were And this was, um... This was, um... Last Friday, as we reported earlier. The Resident Evil 2 Remake demo was released earlier today, as the title should imply. Being called a one-shot demo, you have a very limited time with it. To be precise, players are given just 30 minutes to, of playtime to fight their way through this section of the remake. A different part of Resident Evil 2 Remake than I covered during my hands-on preview with it, 
at Gamescom. I'm certainly interested in playing a bit more. Are 30 minutes enough for me? Sure. It's hardly likely that Capcom is going to throw an unbeatable section at players, though if players want to play for longer and thoroughly explore everything in the demo, they may be in luck. And this is on the same website, uh, WCC Tech Tech, by Chris Ray, according to a post in the Steam community. Right, so here we go. Um, according to a post in the Steam community, the 30 limit, 30 minute time limit has apparently been cracked. Just how secure this crack is, though, is left down to the user to decide. As with anything of an unverified source, Frag Futuristic, the poster of this thread states, PC Master Races, download here. There's a, now there's a link to the um, One Shot Demo Plus 4 trainer. Hmm. You need a fresh 30 minutes account to use the trainer. Without RE, without res, without R2 demo achievements, unlocked, edit player stoibs, also played with the trophies unlocked and achieved. Profit. Enjoy. In reality, there may not be a whole lot to actually see in this demo. We know the demo teases some classic and quirky characters, uh, including a secret one from the original Resident Evil 2. Will, be, will there be more teasers and hints found by those more observant? And with the extra time, only time will tell. Until then, I'll be playing through the demo sometime this weekend without the crack. As Capcom intended, it should give me the perk that keeps me it keeps my interest levels high for when Resident Evil 2 Remake comes out on the 25th on the PC, PS4 and Xbox One. Now I'm actually on board with this demo. I'm looking forward to it. I'm definitely going to try it out. Kojima visits Guerrilla Games to show the Death Stranding to show Death Stranding to the team. This is on Metal Gear Informer. At this moment, Hideo Kojima is in Amsterdam at Guerrilla Games and showed off the progress he and his team have made on Death Stranding. Managing director Herman Holst, as well as others at Guerrilla, seem to be impressed with what they saw as Kojima played through the first two hours of the game to demonstrate what they had built. Kojima Productions is collaborating with Guerrilla Games on the Decima engine, the game engine that powers both studios' titles. When Kojima started his own studio a few years ago, Herman Holst handed him the engine's code so he could get started right away. That's how the collaboration between the Dutch and Japanese studio began and Kojima Productions even set up a satellite studio within Guerrilla Games. So say it was just there. So say just some uh, pictures of him being there. And so Kojima has paid a visit to Guerrilla Games earlier with the purpose on, of working on the Decima engine and this could be a similar trip. 
Death Stranding is rumoured to be released later this year, although no official release date has been revealed as of yet. Very interesting. And who knows what's going to happen? Right, on to Polygon now, and Michael McWhorter uh, is now, uh, is the man that wrote the uh, article, uh, this was just yesterday. So here we go. Legendary Pokemon Kyogre and Groudon return to raids as Pokemon Go's new event is all about Hoenn Pokemon. Pokemon Go players can stock up on Pokemon from the Hoenn region this month as part of a two week event in Niantic's mobile game. Starting on January 15th at 1pm Pacific Standard Time, Pokemon from the Hoenn region will appear more often in the wild. That includes shiny versions of the Pokemon Taillow and Zigzagoon, and legendary Pokemon Kyogre and Groudon, who will be featured in raid battles. Shroomish evolved into Breloom can learn the move Grass Knot, while 7k eggs will spawn Hoenn Pokemon. The event will come to an end at, on January 29th at 1pm Pacific Standard Time. During that two-week event, Niantic and the Pokemon Company will also give some love to Phoebus, the ugly duckling fish Pokemon of the Hoenn region. On January 19th, Pokemon Go will include a limited time research task. Will include limited time research tasks as Poke at Pokestops, which, when completed, will offer encounters with Phoebus and Shiny Phoebus. That should make evolving. That should make evolving that Militichia missing much easier. The Phoebus research tasks will be available in the Americas on January 19th, from. 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. A handful of Hoenn Pokemon still aren't available in Pokemon Go. It remains to be seen if this month's event will bring us closer to their arrival. Update yesterday, the most exciting shiny addition to the game is a shiny Groudon, which players are currently finding in raid battles. It's a very nice emerald colour. Good luck finding it. Shiny Kyogre is available too. It's also a lovely jewel tone, but this version of the legendary has been found in the game before. Nothing new there. All I'm asking is, where in the world is my shiny Rayquaza? Where is my shiny dragons? Give us our sh If you're gonna have the whole end region event, include freaking Rayquaza!
Anyway, another article on Polygon, and it'll, it'll be the last article of the day. Here we go. Xbox Game Pass for January. Shadow of Mordor, We Happy Few, and more. Now, I had We Happy Few in the dishonorable mentions. So anyway, here we go. Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor headlines the new offerings for the rest of January on Xbox Game Pass. The 2014 open world adventure joins Xbox 360, Saints Row the Third, Le the Lego Movie video game, and We Happy Few. We Happy Few coming to Xbox Game Pass today, in fact, is the newest of the bunch, launching in August, which had been in a, it had been in early access since 2016. It's by Compulsion Games, which Microsoft acquired last year. The game merges role-playing and survival elements as the player navigates drugged-out dystopian 1960s. A, a drug that dystopia in 1960s, where Great Britain was invaded and conquered in World War II. That's pleasant. Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor arrives on January 24th, launched in 2014 for Xbox One, and was followed by Middle Earth Shadow of War in 2017. The Lego like Movie video game, January 17th, was also launched in 2014, and Saints Row III is coming on January 24th, is the oldest of the group, premiering in 2011. They join Absolver, Ark Survival Evolved, Just Cause 3, and Life is Strange 2 is first chapter, which were added to the library earlier this month. The Xbox Game Pass library comprises more than 200 titles and is available to subscribers for $9.99 a month. New subscribers can get their first month for just $1. $7.99 over here in the UK. And now we've got 49 trophies in this game, which means only one thing, ladies and gentlemen, last section of the show. Points and trophies, trophy achievement hunting. Points and trophies, trophy achievement hunting. Yep, points and trophies as always. And uh, in honor of the game being ported to PlayStation 4 today, it initially released in Japan in 2010, Europe and North America in 2011. It is available today on PlayStation 4. So here we go. I'm gonna go through the regular trophies first and it's all bronzes and silvers. And they are as follows. Welcome to SEGA! Play all mini games at Club SEGA! Weapon Master. Create one or more weapons with for each weapon category. Way of the Pachinko King. King. Obtain the trophy prize in Pachinko. Way of the Keymaster. Open five coin lockers. Walking Bank. Possess, possess 10 million yen or more. VIP member. Become a VIP member at the massage parlor. The Joy of Gifting. Have a hostess wear a present you give her. The Human Jukebox. Sing all songs at karaoke. That one will be fun. Table Tennis Pro, smash the ball three times in one match. Star of the Coliseum, acquire the title, Star of the Coliseum. Shogi Promotion, achieve a promotion in Shogi. Seven pairs, collect two of each different tile pattern in Mahjong. Oh, I love Mahjong. Revelation Seeker, acquire three revelations. Novice Gambler, play all non-casino gambling games. Mr. Outdoors, golf and fish five times each. Memo Master, Collect all memos in the pause menu. Master in training. Have one of your apprentices win the rookie tournament in Fighter Maker. Kamurocho Stampede King. Knock over 100 people as you pass by. Kamurocho Iron Man. Traverse 100 kilometers or more. History buff. Review all reminiscences of, from Yakuza to Yakuza 3. Hat trick. Achieve a hat trick and dance. Whatever that means. Gourmet of Camurocho. Order something at least once at each restaurant. First carom. Uh, win the first point in the four ball pool. Fashionista. Gather at least one outfit from each category in Hostess Maker. Emblem Collector. Collect ten emblems from survivors during gang encounters. Casino Rookie. Play all casino gambling games. Captain Tufa. Successfully hit two panels at once at the batting centre. Business Card Hunter. Receive business cards from all hostesses, including ones you train in Hostess Maker. Boiled Turkey. Achieve a turkey in bowling, which is basically three strikes in a row. After work hookup. Have a hostess invite you on an after work date. 40 substories. Complete or finish 40 substories. 
four sub-stories. Complete or finish four sub-stories. 20 sub-stories. Complete or finish 20 sub-stories. And the, and the rest of the regular trophies are silver trophies. Tanimura Award. Acquire 10,000 casino points playing as Tanimura. Seijima Award. Complete. Purchase five handguns playing as Seijima. Kiru. Kuryu Award. Destroy 100 rare pins you pick up playing as Kuryu. Indomitable. Clear modern mode without reverting to easy mode. In other words, don't turn the difficulty down. Doesn't look like it's stackable. Heir to the powerful. Max all characters to level 20. Akiyama Award. Earn 1 million yen playing as Akiyama. And on to the secret trophies, which are just... We've got bronze trophies. So here we go. We've got part four cleared. Clear part four of the story. Part three cleared. Part two, part one. Basically story related. Kamurocho Tree Hugger. Pick up 20 pieces of trash around the city. Air to the ultimate. Clear all ultimate skill missions. Thank you. Clear the finale. Air to the legend. Clear extra hard mode. Amon defeated. Defeat Amon and get through all the sub-stories. You get all those and you get the elusive platinum trophy! For, well, getting all the other trophies in the game. And there we go. That is it for this week's edition of the Trophy Achievement Podcast. I uh, hope you enjoyed what you saw. If you did, as always, hit the thumbs up. And if you want to be baptized into following this channel, hit the subscribe button down at the bottom. Click the bell to join the latter day notification squad so you don't miss anything I do on this channel. Also, uh, support me on Patreon if you can to get early access to my podcast. Uh, Patreon.com slash Kenzie Retro. Follow me on Twitter at Kenzie Retro as well. We, so if you need... So if the notifications don't work on uh, YouTube, you can follow me on Twitter and you'll get um, and you'll be able to get uh, all notifications on what uh, goes up on my Twitter as well. So whatever I post, whatever I do on my YouTube channel will be posted to will be pushed to my Twitter. So make sure you turn notifications on for Twitter as well. In the meantime, uh, I've got uh, some Rocket League action this weekend. Uh, I've got the quarterfinals of the uh, NF uh, Ro Rocket League NFL playoffs, and then later on in the week, uh, and then next week we'll have the uh, semi-finals, and then it will be finals weekend. Well, it'll, be, it'll be finals day. We'll have two four-quarter matches. Anyway, hope you, anyway, uh, hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day. Peace out, and stay faithful as always.